As Dan said, uh, this all began in 1999 when he called my father and uh, described a boat which Ken quickly uh, corrected us on that this is not a boat, this is a ship. And you ride on a boat if your ship sinks. So a, a boat is a lifeboat, but a ship is what crosses the lake. So when we met with Ken, and we being uh, myself and my partner at our firm, Oyvind Solvang, Ken presented this concept of a high-speed auto passenger ferry crossing Lake Michigan on a seasonal basis to avoid the hassle of driving through Chicago. He told us that the technology existed, it would be an all-aluminum high-speed ship, something that would not have been possible as recently as 10 years prior, that the, the port had already commissioned a number of market demand studies that looked positive, that the city of Milwaukee would cooperate with building a terminal and leasing it to the newly formed company, and to the best of his analysis, the business would be profitable. So we were intrigued by the concept and agreed to pursue it. Now, Dan called us venture capitalists, but we're venture capitalists where we try to minimize the risk and take the venture out of the undertaking. In other words, what we did with Ken is start from scratch in building a business plan and investigating and doing due diligence on every aspect of it to minimize as much risk as we possibly could. So what did we do? We had Ken from the port of Milwaukee, but he was employed there. He had the idea, he was the visionary, he was the impetus, he was the catalyst. And on our side, we had myself and, as I mentioned, my partner, Oyvind Solvang. Because we didn't have, we typically back a CEO who has spent a career in whatever the industry is. Because we didn't have that, we ourselves had to jump in and assume a level of involvement and accountability much greater than we normally would. So when someone says, do you want to build a ship to cross the lake, it's like, where to even begin to try to pursue something like that? So let me explain what we did. First, we started getting on airplanes, flying around the country with Ken, visiting shipyards. So, you know, and Ken had met a number of these people uh, earlier in his career. And, you know, we'd walk in there and we'd be introduced as we're Milwaukeeans. He's with the port of Milwaukee. No, we have no experience with, sh with operating ships, owning ships. Well, I've been on a wave runner, I've been on a sailboat, but, you know. <laughs> Would you like to build us a $20 million ship? So, you know, you can imagine we had a very steep learning curve. But uh, what we did is uh, we interviewed these firms, these shipyards, to really understand what their experience levels were with all aluminum ships. What kind of a, you know, general price they would charge. Did they have availability within their shipyard? Uh, you know, these ships take over a year to build generally, so, you know, a shipyard can get filled up very quickly. What sort of design capabilities did they have? Did they understand our route? What, you know, kind of, what sort of businessmen were they? Could, would we philosophically feel comfortable dealing with them? And ultimately, um, we settled on a shipyard in Mobile, Alabama, it was an Australian company that was establishing, uh, let's call it a beachhead here in the U.S., called Austo USA. And um, what happened from just this concept of a ship going back and forth turned into, uh, as I've said, an all-aluminum catamaran, so two hulls, that would carry 250 passengers, 46 cars, be 192 feet long, 57 feet wide. It was powered by four 3,000 horsepower Detroit, Detroit diesel engines 
and four water jets. It was a double layer with the car deck on the first layer, first level, and passengers on the second level. So while we were visiting shipyards, then we also needed to engage in, well, we need two terminals, one on each side. And uh, the Milwaukee Terminal is, as you know, on the south side of the home bridge, named after Dan's grandfather. We had to do that because, you know, he brought the deal to us. <laughs> and, um, you know, Ken was very active uh, searching out sites on the other side of the lake. Uh, ultimately, we selected Muskegon, but Grand Haven and Saugatuck, two very popular tourist locations, were also heavily considered. So, it, you know, in addition to just finding the location, we then had to negotiate leases. Ultimately, on the Michigan side, we negotiated a lease with a private landowner who, who built the facility for us. Here, it's the city of Milwaukee that technically owns uh, our terminal, though we have a 40-year lease, so, I mean, we control it, but they own it. But we had to design it, both the exterior, the traffic flow, the uh, interior design, and, um, you know, so all these items are kind of going on simultaneously with trying to design the ship and negotiate that price. So on top of all that, then we started reviewing the Port of Milwaukee uh, market studies that had been done. And these were done in prior years, so we had to confirm their validity and were they still relevant. And then we commissioned new studies to review the old studies and do new studies. And this is all uh, with the objective of what is the size of the market, who are our customers, how much are they willing to pay for as an adult, one way round trip, what about children, what about cars, what about motorcycles, what about pets, trailers, bicycles. So there were market studies uh, and price sensitivities done on all of that. And um, in addition to what kind of services did they want? Was it just get on a ship, cross, or did they want movies, music, entertainment? How comfortable should it be? How fast did it need to be? Did they want to eat? sandwiches, yogurt, Diet Coke, beer, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, as I'm, I'm just trying to tell you all this to kind of build up how uh, chaotic it was and how many different directions we were going in because it was really the three of us, Ken who had a full-time job at the port <laughs> and Oyvind and myself. So layering on top of this further, was uh, dealing with the U.S. Coast Guard because uh, it's a highly regulated industry as well as there, there's not a lot, but there are a certain number of city and state uh, regulations. And that's, that was all the easy part. The hardest was getting financing for this. And um, I call it the Jones Act, but Ken might give you a, a more detailed description of what it is, but it's, it's, an, it's an act that uh, I've described as the Full Employment Act of Shipyards for the U.S., and it's been around for, what, since 1889. The Jones Act requires that any boat or ship operating between two U.S. ports has to be built in the U.S., and so that enables U.S. shipyards to have a funnel of demand for anyone operating in the U.S., which is also, interestingly enough, why oftentimes cruise ships leave from Vancouver going up to Alaska so they don't have to be built in the U.S. or they go from Miami to the Caribbean. Anyway, um, we couldn't get Muskegon to become Canadian, so we had to have our ship built in the U.S. And so I started, you know, I deal, I deal with banks a lot. I started contacting banks. I must have contacted 10 or 15 banks. And, um, and these were banks that had a track record in financing maritime operations, mainly barges or, you know, bigger uh, fuel vessels and things like that. 
but I didn't find any meaningful interest from any bank. And, uh, you know, I started with, uh, this is the cost of the ship, will you do 80% financing? How about 70? How about 60? How about 50? They wouldn't do anything. And, uh, you know, it was a big splash of cold water. Their feeling was, this is a specialty route, a specialty ship, you have no prior track record. And, you know, the lake, uh, the Clipper, the Milwaukee Clipper used to operate there, but that was a long time ago. That then uh, ultimately led us to uh, the Maritime Administration, which is part of the Department of Transportation in Washington, D.C., and they have um, what's called a Title 11 program, which um, goes hand in glove with the Jones Act. Title 11 finances ships built in U.S. shipyards. So, uh, you know, we actively started pursuing that financing program and uh, engaged Washington Legal Counsel to assist us. Now, maritime is a very specialized field, and we went through two sets of attorneys before we found a third firm that really uh, understood this maritime financing. And so uh, the maritime administration told us, well, we like your market studies, we like your shipyard, uh, yes, we like your track record, Lubar, in other things, but, you know, who's really going to operate the ship? And again, I mean, Ken, he can do a lot of stuff, but <laughs> he wasn't going to be the captain. So um, we didn't have a captain, and we had no track record in operating ships, so we had to find a ship operator. So uh, with, you know, Ken, Ken uh, again, knew the field, and he put us in touch with Hornblower Marine Services, which is a third-party ship operator. They're the best-known firm in the industry. So they had, uh, they, they really had uh, sort of the name in the industry. They, they had captains that they could recruit in. And what we needed to do then was analyze, well, what are our operations? What would they do and what would we do? So, they operated the ship in the terminal. They handled maintenance, and we handled reservations, the call center, accounting, cash management, marketing, fuel, IT. And um, food and beverage. So you want to talk about detail, we're sitting around discussing what kind of potato chips are we going to serve on board? Is this going to be rye bread or whole wheat? I mean, and I'm not kidding you. When, when we, it's like, Ken, what are we doing here? But, uh, you know, we got into a lot of detail. And so everything I just described took from 1999 through 2003. So the summer of 2003, we had the shipyard. We had the ship substantially designed. We had uh, the two terminals substantial, the leases done, the terminals substantially designed. We had the contractors lined up. We had the uh, third party ship operator lined up, that contract signed. And we were just trying to finalize the financing in Washington, D.C. And there must have been eight or 10 meetings back and forth, at least eight feet of documents that we had submitted. And we'd go back there kind of time and time again to uh, make our presentation. We repeated ourselves at least eight or ten times. Um, you know, and they, they would probably have eight or ten people in the room. Three of them would be sleeping, you know, and uh, a couple of them would be really interested. So we had one or two strong advocates which helped push the whole thing through. Um, and complicating it was that the, the Badger uh, up in Manitowoc was uh, totally opposed to our coming into the market. And so they uh, employed a lot of tactics that uh, we would never do. 
but needless to say, it was, uh, it became a, a dogfight that uh, ultimately uh, we were successful with. And, uh, and that's on the one side. And on the other, as the weeks would go by, the shipyard would call us and say, you know, we're running out of time. If this doesn't get going, the ship won't be ready in time for the next summer season. And a ship like this, who needs it to be delivered in November? You, know, you want it at the beginning of the season. The Maritime Administration came through. We pulled the trigger. All these contracts became effective. They were all lined up, so none of them would be effective until we had our financing put in place. So it's just this huge domino. And um, I thought it had been busy and chaotic beforehand. But I mean, there was activity you know, from Mobile, Alabama, to Washington, to one side of the lake, to the other. And so we were building a ship, the two terminals, searching out the software for the reservation system, you know, our accounting systems, working on PR, figuring out you know, who we're going to hire, how we're going to be staffed. It was, um, I mean, it was exhilarating. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but it, it, I think something of that kind of intensity doing it once was, was uh, enough. <laughs> Believe it or not, it all came together in time for our June 1st, 2004 launch. Everything except the Milwaukee Terminal. It was about a month late, as I recall. So uh, we launched. It was very complicated. We had hired multiple crews because we were operating three round trips, so 18 hours a day, one ship going between two locations. If you think about it, and we hadn't really figured this out, we couldn't even hold a company meeting because a third of our workers were always working. They were on the ship going from one side to the other. So in terms of something that we would learn on like the morning crossing, just in terms of operations, in terms of loading cars, loading passengers, offloading, it was very difficult to transmit that knowledge to the next crew. And so the first year, which was under the direction of our third party uh, operator was, uh, was challenging, let me just say that. It, it, was, it was an operational mess. Uh, you know, luckily we had lots of goodwill that had been built up and the passengers were highly impressed with the ship and the ride and um, you know, everyone really gave us the benefit of the doubt. Ken officially uh, left the port of Milwaukee at the end of that first summer, joined Lake Express, and uh, you know, ever since, our operations have improved. He's, he's taken the company, and uh, step by step, he's gone through every one of the functional areas, and he's strengthened them and improved productivity. We were under contract with our third-party operator for the first three years, but I'd say effectively, uh, they didn't do anything constructive for us after halfway through the second summer. We just didn't have a way to cancel the contract, so it cost us a little money. So as I look back, it was an incredible undertaking with many interrelated components. We had an unbelievable team led by Ken. We addressed these issues in our pre-startup systematically. We were totally objective in, in our analysis, and we were very patient in our approach. In other words, at any point during that whole process, despite having invested you know, three years, we were willing to drop the project, I'm sorry, Dan, if the due diligence didn't prove that this was going to be successful. So you know, sunk costs in terms of your time and startup expenses are one thing, but you know, you never want to go forward just because you feel like you'd be too embarrassed to drop the project or you have so much time invested. You always have to be willing to say, no, this no longer makes sense if that's the conclusion you reach. 
Fortunately, we never reached that, and we went forward. And so when I look back, I look back to our original uh, projections uh, in preparation of this, and uh, you know, I'm actually quite impressed with the accuracy of our original financial projections in terms of ridership and, uh, and cash flow. And um, you know, I'd, I'd say it was amazingly accurate and that the future turned out to be very similar to what we had projected except for one big item. And that's the price of fuel, which was in the 75 to 80 cents a gallon when we started and you know, recently has been 375 to four dollars a gallon, which as you can imagine has uh, put a lot of uh, stress on the business. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that under Ken Zali's direction, he's learned how to deal with it and uh, each and every year comes up with improved uh, marketing and promotional ideas and improved productivity in the operations. And that is the Lake Express story. Thank you.